so don't just help wildlife in my day-to-day -day business uh, that I run. Um, and for those who don't know, I, I, I'm sure uh, ladies might mind me giving a quick little plug here to Humane Wildlife Solutions. We we work closely with one kind and have done over the past um, few years. Uh, we are Europe's only non-lethal alternative to pest control. So we do pest control, but we don't harm any of the animals in the process. And when I'm not doing that amazing work, I'm often doing other amazing work, helping more animals. And um, the story I'm about to tell this evening is, is one of those other jobs that I end up doing. And this is completely voluntary. It's just my love for wildlife. If I'm not working helping wildlife, I'm out surveying some some kind of species to try and and, um, and help wildlife too. So it's it's just what I do. So... With that small intro, I'll share my screen. And um, if someone can just, oh, uh, it, it says you need to allow me to, to share it. It says I'm not allowed to share. I know, Kevin, sorry. Right, perfect. Um, I think this one will do. Can you all see my screen? Can you see the Harvest Mile screen? <laughs> yep. Ooh, okay, right. So let's get started then. Um, the search for the lost harvest mice of Scotland. And you can see how adorably cute they are. But they're also very, very, very small little mice. So harvest mice. I'll give you a quick rundown of what a harvest mouse is. Um, if you're from Scotland, there's a very, 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 very big chance that you've never seen a harvest mouse in Scotland. Um, unless... Uh, 60, 70 years ago in Edinburgh, you maybe came across one. Um, they're very, very tiny creatures. Um, they're currently red listed in Scotland, which means their numbers um, are, are very, very low. Um, and if we consider that just a few years ago, we're talking a couple of years ago, officially harvest mice weren't even designated as being in Scotland anymore. They didn't even think they were they were up this far in, in the UK. Um, as you can see, they're near threatened, um, but in Scotland, they're critical. And that's changed since um, what I'm about to tell you tonight. They love rough grass areas. So you're talking tall grasses, tussocks, they'll like reed beds, grassland, hedgerows, really keen on linear um, areas for some reason. So like road verges, ditches, headlines, they're really, really keen on these these little wildlife corridors. And it's another reason why, why having these strips of, of um, grass which has gone wild, hedges which has been allowed to grow, are so important because they, they sustain so many different species and harvest mice really, really, really relies on them. As you can see from the pictures there, that's, that's what harvest mice looks like. Cute little uh, button eyes, cute little noses. Um, and the only prehensile um, tail in, in I believe, in mammals in uh, the UK. So what, by, by that, I mean they can use their tail almost like a, uh, a, a fifth limb. So they use it to, uh, to coil around things they're climbing across and they'll use it to help them uh, get around their environment. They weigh between four and six grams. So that's really, really, really light. And 50 to 70 millimeters um, body size so they we're, we're talking very 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 small little mice so it's no wonder people um are not seeing them um and they can live roughly about 18 months um although they have a really really high mortality because at a food chain they're at the very bottom so a lot of creatures will eat these uh these harvest mice but they have a really good way to counter that and that is that they breed a lot and quick and then they spread out nicely as well from there. So um, it's nature's way of just trying to um, keep their numbers going and, and hopefully the probability of survival, because there's so many of them, will work. Now, when you put that into a case like for Scotland, where they're not even thought to exist, it's, it, they need a lot more mice to, to keep going. So as you see here, um, this is the Mammal Society's um, red list for Scotland mammals. And you can just see that the harvest mice, they're in, uh, crit critically endangered along with wildcats. So they're one of our most endangered species in Scotland. They're not really given much um, 
time to to speak about um because many other lovely species often uh steal the limelight so the harvest mouse is uh, of a very forgotten species i'd like to think which definitely definitely uh needs our help so history of scottish harvest mice so this is this is really interesting this through so i should explain i am the scottish coordinator for the harvest mouse surveys for the mammal society so it was my voluntary role to take on the whole of Scotland and try and find harvest mice, which is probably even harder looking for a needle in a haystack. Um, most people who um, are coordinators for the Mammal Society will get a county. So down in England, you'll get ones at Essex and Surrey and Kent and so on. Well, up here, I was the only coordinator who had a whole country to themselves to go and survey. And I, I gave it a really good shot, which we'll, we'll go over uh, shortly. But when I got made coordinator, um, to for, for Scotland for the harvest mouse surveys, I really delved into the history of harvest mice in Scotland to try and figure out where they were. And as you can see on um, my my screen here, um, they were thought to be long gone. Was sporadic rec records. So this is just people now and again saying they're seeing a harvest mouse here and there, um, but no colonies were were really found. And by what I mean of a colony is where there's numerous mice and they're breeding. And they're spreading out and um, and they're effectively just surviving in the wild. Now, there's a few hot spots uh, across Scotland historically. One is Renfrewshire. So as you can see there, it was a real big stronghold for harvest mice. Records dating back to 1736 in Linwood, 1895 in Kilbarkin, and 1898 in Paisley. Now, the Paisley site, weirdly enough, now it is in the heart of Paisley. So since 1898, Paisley's grown so much the place where harvest mice were found no longer exists. But the Linwood and Kilbarkin sites are still there. Um, I've surveyed both um, and sadly didn't find any harvest mice there. There's also been real historical records right in Aberdeenshire um, around uh, the golf course in Kemney. I went up there to survey, so a long way to go from Glasgow, where I'm based, um, to go up there and get permission from the golf course to go and survey um, their golf course. Sadly, once again, I didn't find any harvest mice. There was fantastic harvest mouse habitat. They could have survived there, but there was none um, found there at all. There were a few records just recently for Aberdeen um, in 2020, as you can see on my screen. And that was, we believe, either a miss, um, miss recording, so someone making a false, uh, well, not a false identification, uh, an incorrect identification of a species, or we think it might have been uh, ones that have been released, but did survey the area and um, we didn't find anything in extensive searches around uh, Aberdeen. Now, a bit closer to where one kind of based in Edinburgh, um, from 1968 and 1976, uh, in Morton Hall area, so southern part of the city between the boundary and the bypass, um, had been records of harvest mice. Now, I've been there and done some surveys. I need to do some more um, this survey season, which ends in March. Um, and I'm hoping to try and find in there because we are, well, I have a theory that the harvest mice are clinging on in places where there's very minimal human um, activity and interference. And you may think the bypass um is not that area because there's a big bypass there but the verges around and back and on to the bypass are very very um harvest mouse friendly areas they're very very minimally uh managed and they're left to to, to grow and if you take from edinburgh if you follow the canal all the way over to glasgow that's another route where we're going to be stepping up our, our surveys this year to help to hopefully try and find more so let's move on to the next screen so here uh, this is from MBN Atlas. So um, if you ever want to try and see what species are in an area, if you go to NBN Atlas, it is a fantastic site. It's full of biological records dating back hundreds of years. And you can go and click an area. So in this screenshot you'll see here, I've put in Morton Hall and I've gone down and selected the, the species. Um, and I've chosen mammals here, and this brings up the mammal records for that area. And you can see there's four records of harvest mice being officially recorded in this area. And you can see other species which are also being recorded in the area. But 
this this is the historical data I've been working off, pinpointing these areas, and then going there and then researching um, the entire site. You can see where my blue pin is. Um, that's the bypass, and you can see where the line from Morton Hall goes all the way down. Now, I, I've not confirmed this, but I wonder if these records are going down the way because the mice have slowly been pushed out. Now, the two lower records um, is still perfect habitat when I was there surveying. Um, lovely big cornfields, which would be absolutely perfect for harvest mice with good verges, which they could survive on. So I'll have to check that one again, but we did go and sadly didn't find any in this location. So this is the range I was telling you about. So this is uh, the Mammal Society's 2018 um, harvest mouse map. And as you can see, there's nothing in Scotland. It goes up to the northeast of England and some in the bottom of the Lake District. Um, and massive coverage in England. But as you can see there, Scotland is completely barren and bare. So it could ask, well, could raise questions why um, a harvest mouse survey was done in Scotland when they didn't think they were any further north. Um, then I think that's probably around Middlesbrough area, probably a bit higher. Um, but yeah, you can see there, it was just, if then if they are there, they weren't being detected or being found. So the idea of me going out surveying for harvest mice is I would go out to a um, an area. We were given um, historical sites to go and do the first year. This year, we're going to do new sites. But I would go out to an area and you will be looking for the right kind of habitat. So you're talking like real big, thick, grassy tussocks. Um, so kind of like the, the first image you see there. Um, and you're going to be basically delving into the middle of it, pulling it apart, the grass tussock, you're not damaging the habitat, but what you're looking for is a perfect harvest mouse nest, which is just kind of like the size um, of, of a tennis ball. Now, when we do the surveys, we do them from October to March. The reason we do this is because they're finished their breeding season and there should be a lot of um, harvest mouse breeding nests. So these are the ones about the size of a tennis ball, which will be dotted around an area. So if you imagine you go to a site and you find one nest, if that nest has been successful, the harvest mice usually only go between, I think it's between five and 15 feet from the original nest. So those young will spread out and they'll breed. So they can have a couple of um, litters uh, every breeding season. And uh, a pair will maybe have two or three litters in one season. And then what that will happen and what that will see when you go to survey, if you find one nest in the middle, if you look within a good 10 um, foot radius of that nest, you typically will find another one. Now they don't, harvest mice won't use these breeding nests in the winter time. So when they're breeding in the, in the spring and summer, they'll usually be about 30 centimeters or so off the ground in their nest in nice fresh grass tussocks. So you're waiting for the fresh grass to come through. The harvest mice will get these strands of grass and they'll bind them all together into a ball and it'll typically be attached to that grass and then that grass will die because the harvest mouse has eaten it, but it makes a perfect nest for the harvest mice. So this time of year when we're surveying, they will have really small solitary nests, but they're much lower to the ground and much more hidden away. So in the, the breeding season in the summer, they'll be in open grassland, in tussocks, um, in, in fields. But when it comes to the winter time, they usually hunker down um, into more inaccessible places. So you're, you're talking like you're the bases of walls in the hedge lines, along ditches, um, areas like that, because, you know, they need to um, protect themselves from the elements. So they, they, they kind of abandon these bigger nests to make really small ones tucked away in nice places. So if you're ever going out and you ever find a really small grass nest, which is probably between 10 and 30 centimetres in the ground, it's most likely going to be a harvest mouse nest. And if you ever do find one, and if you're inspired to go out looking for these after this, this talk, um, please do get in touch with me. Um, the ladies will give you my details if you need to get in touch. Uh, Rachel and Lauren will, will uh, send you my way if you want to get, help getting involved. But if you ever find a nest which is green, um, that means it's occupied. So it's always best to leave it and, uh, uh, and not disturb them. So this chart here shows you the best way to identify a harvest mouse and nest. Um, you've probably all looked at that and gone over it numerous times already, so I won't go through that. Um, but as you can see, there's um, it, it can be quite easy to find a harvest 
mouse nest um if you know what you're looking for and where where you're looking so i'll start the the story so i got offered to to start the harvest mouse survey in up in scotland and um there was a national survey done and at that point we hadn't found any so no nest had been found and um it was down at Hunston uh, Nuclear Power Plant in Ayrshire, in North Ayrshire, on the coast. And um, I decided I was going to go and check this site because there had been a, a record of a dead harvest mouse or what we believe to be a harvest mouse found on the road there. Now, we know when it comes to surveying, just a dead creature would not be enough um, for you to say that there's harvest mice living there. So... I went there on on the, the the mission to try and find a harvest mouse nest, which you can see in my hand there. Now it was on 30th of January 2022. I went to uh, Hunterston in the middle of a storm for some reason, um, but I was just in the area, so it made sense to go and have a quick look. So I pulled up in my car and I parked at the nuclear power station. Which, if you ever can do anything like that, please give the security heads up because I had the police come and uh, scout me out and talk to me. Um, a couple of times asking what I was doing. Now you can imagine when I'm telling them I'm looking for an animal which is not meant to be here, it doesn't sound like a really good excuse um, when you're next to such a high um, high risk security um, building as a nuclear power plant. But they allowed me to carry on. And uh, so I was sitting in my car, parked right where I needed to be to do the survey, uh, but it was raining and it was really strong winds. And then just all of a sudden after about, 20 minutes or so waiting, the weather just died down. And I was like, right, okay, I've got a little uh, weather uh, window here. So I got out of the car and I must have took about 10, 15 steps behind the car. And there was a lovely big grass tussocks and I was getting stuck in. Um, would you believe it? I actually found a harvest mouse nest. Um, I couldn't quite believe it. So I, I took a video of it and I didn't put a video in the, in the uh, chat here. So sorry about that. And just to prove that I actually found it, I've got the photos in the video with the power station in the background. So fantastic. It was it was really, really good. A harvest mouse nest had been found in Scotland. So this hadn't been, no one had found a harvest mouse nest before that for a very, very long time going back to historical records. So it was a really, really big deal because at this point, when I found that harvest mouse nest, they weren't thought to even be in Scotland at all. So it was a huge, huge find. And um, I feel really honoured and very, very lucky in that small weather window that I had. I only had 10 minutes before the weather got too bad and I had to stop to be able to find this nest. Now, I thought I'd take the nest home so I, I could analyse it. And I had it in a bag. And as soon as I got out of the car, the, the weather conditions, like I said, were really stormy, very strong winds, lots of rain. The wind whooshed the nest out of my bag and it flew across the road and landed in the gutter in the rain and the nest disintegrated. And I was like, oh no, I just found the very first harvest mouse nest in Scotland for decades, if not longer. And within half an hour, it's now spread all over the road and washed down in the gutter. I was a little bit gutted, I got on it. But it doesn't matter, I had the evidence that it was there. So this then led me on to do lots more surveys. And being the Scottish coordinator, I had a lot of areas to cover. Um, in the end, um, managed to go to 16 different survey sites um, in eight different counties in Scotland. So Aberdeen City, Aberdeenshire, Edinburgh, Fife, North Ayrshire, North Lanarkshire, South Lanarkshire and the Scottish borders. We only found harvest mice in North Ayrshire. And if you see the picture, at the bottom here, that's a nuclear power station um, on the left-hand side. And this bit of grass you see in front, so you've got the stone wall, and now you've got a bit of grass which goes to the to the road on the left-hand side of that wall. On the right-hand side of the wall is the grass tussocks where I actually found the harvest mouse nest. And you can actually see, if you look on the very right-hand side of the picture, you'll see the sand and the sea. So this site is right on the seafront. Um, it's an incredible place to go if you're a birder because um, there's incredible birds there. But all these years, wildlife uh, enthusiasts have been down this area and not realised they were literally walking over harvest mice who were clinging on to this little area. Now, the reason I, I believe that the harvest mice continued here is because there was 
no disturbance there. You know, they, you can't go and build on a coastal strip like that next to a nuclear power station. You, you just wouldn't get permission. So these mice have been there, and we have no idea how long they've been there for. Have been surviving on this small strip of grassland um, in in North Asia. And once I made this uh, um, this discovery to um, the nuclear power station, I believe it's EDF who own the power station. They immediately and surprisingly um, put in loads of uh, bylaw protections, I believe, for these mice. So that whole strip you see there now is fully and legally protected for the harvest mice, because at the moment, this is the only breeding colony of harvest mice in the whole of Scotland. And it's really good because the the, the power station um, wildlife management team are fully on board and this area will never be touched and never be managed. It will just be left purely for the harvest mice. So just by complete luck, me finding this one nest, we've now guaranteed the safety and uh, protection of these harvest mice. That's not to say natural, um, um, I don't want to say disasters, I guess from uh, harvest mouse, natural disasters like rising sea levels or flooding there could really, really impact them. But they've been there long enough to survive um, and uh, they continue to survive there really, really well at the moment. So with the, the surveying, um, and as you can see, it's another nice picture of a harvest mouse there, sir. Um, I did over a thousand miles covering all over Scotland. Um, and I was really lucky. I got to train so many uh, enthusiastic um, volunteers who wanted to come out and, and learn how to find harvest mice. And um, so this is one of the things I do as a coordinator. I train people. We train loads of people the last couple of years to go out and find harvest mice nests. Um, so if you're interested in coming along and I mean, train you how to find harvest mice and going off on your own and surveying your own patch. Um, I would definitely do it because um, it's really good fun. It gets you outside and you might make that discovery in your county, wherever you are. Um, if you are in Scotland, and not everyone will, will be in Scotland in the, in, in, the, uh, in the audience here. But just imagine that you go away, let's say in Fife or in the Highlands or one of the Isles and I train you on how to do it and you go check your own patch and then suddenly, lo and behold, you find that first harvest mouse nest or breeding colony of harvest mice in your area. It'll just be an amazing thing for you to discover. Now, with some of the uh, training I've done, one um, uh, lady who I trained down in Ayrshire, she lived just up the road from Hunterston. She actually went back. Um, on the patch, she's been walking her dog for many, many, many years and found a harvest mouse nest and no one knew they existed there. So it just shows you, you, you could be walking your dog or walking a, um, an area in the countryside or even in urban areas, really. If the habitat's there, they could be there and not knowing that every day you're walking past a species which is thought to be lost or extinct in that country. Now, you can see there with with uh, some of the trips I made, um, nice short one, 16 miles away. Um, or the 315 mile round trip, which was the one going from Glasgow to Aberdeen. Um, when I went back to Hunterston um, in the second year after finding that, we found even more nests. So we know the first year we only found the one nest. The second year, I think we found about five or six, maybe even more. And the um, the habitat management team at EDF actually went out and did their own survey, and they also found more nests that I didn't find. So we know at Hunterston, there is a really big breeding colony of wild harvest mice and the first for Scotland, and they have the protection they need uh, to keep them safe, um, which is just fantastic to, to know that's growing and know that we know they're there. So our next plan is to search further north and south of their location. And hopefully, hopefully we can find um, that the harvest mice are spreading up and down the coast because we really do need them to to spread out. So from the surveys I did, um, Hunterston was the only site that returned harvest mouth signs. Um, so there you go. With seven nests being found across the power uh, station area, six more than the, the, the previous year where I found the, the original one. Um, and the other sites I surveyed all over Scotland sadly didn't come up with um, any breeding colonies. It's not to say they weren't there. I'm, I'm very thorough at checking. Um, and I've, I've, I've put a lot of effort into it, but sometimes, you know, you're talking at nests about that size, 
you're talking mice which are even tinier and trying to find them in a in a landscape is a really really tough thing uh, to be able to do um so we didn't find any there but there there were well, there were lots of reports of harvest mice but when you go out and actually investigate the areas where the reports are made you can usually find that actually what they're finding isn't harvest mice at all so we've had that a few times especially when you get um uh like field mice nest or vole nest a lot of people can mistake these from some harvest mice nests so where are we now so again this is the 2018 map and you can see here again there was just nothing at all um in in scotland um but after the reports came in and after the surveys i done this map turned like this. Now you will see there are green dots, other green dots in Scotland. There's one um, south of Glasgow there. There's one just north of the Fourth Road Bridge and one up in Dundee area. We did check all those sites and we haven't actually found anything else there. So um, at the moment, they're gonna be going back to the uh, non-detection. Um, so they'll be grayed out again. But the ones which are clinging on is the ones right on the west coast there, which is where Hunterston uh, Power Station is in North Ayrshire. So those two green squares closely um, tied together is where, at the moment, the harvest mice colonies in um, Scotland are. And if you look at it, so if you just, just look at those two on the left-hand side on the west of Scotland there, and look the distance between them and the ones in England, there's huge, phenomenal distances. Um for a mouse anyway, that there must be something that le links these over. So what we're looking at is either a population which has somehow found its way up into Scotland and came across to Ayrshire and found a safe space there, or from what the historical records show, these mice in North Ayrshire were probably not so far or not so different from the ones that were historically found in Renfrewshire. So what I, I'd probably lean towards that these mice here have been the ones back in the, the 1800s and 1900s, which have, have been there, been recorded like I showed you on MPN Atlas. Um, and as slowly as humans have taken over the landscape, pushed these mice out. Now, in the case of EDF, these mice could have been pushed all the way out to the coast, got no, no further to go. But luckily, there's a power, nuclear power station right next to them, which means people can't build on that land and the see the other side. So... I think it's human activity which has pushed these mice to the very, very limits of um, of their territories. And you really, I, I believe at the moment, only going to find these mice where people um, are not working on the land in any shape or form. But it's not to say there isn't more nests out there, uh, more colonies even, which which could be found. So when I was uh, doing this, I, I, I trained up lots of people uh, who were keen to come out and um, join me in, in looking for harvest mice. And um, I managed to train up 12 people, like I said, one of them at the bottom there, who where she walked with dogs for over a decade, she found a wild harvest mouse nest. So as long as you know what you're looking for, you can you too can go out and look for harvest mice nests in your area. And like I say, if you do so, please get in touch with me first and I will give you all the forms you need, but then also tell me what you find. Even if you don't find anything, that's just as important as finding uh, colonies because then we know where the mice are not um, in Scotland. So we can focus on areas where we think we might be able to find them. So this is a um, an amazing bunch. Um, they all were at uh, one of the um, rural colleges up in Aberdeen, uh, Aberdeenshire, and they all volunteered to come out and we covered loads of ground that day. Um, this was the last site we were covering. And if you see the, the the lady on the left in the yellow jacket you see just to her left you'll see some really big grass tussocks there one to left of the path and one literally just uh, next to her elbow that's the kind of uh, habitat you really don't be looking for here uh this bunch were fantastic i had a really fantastic day with them getting to know them all um and looking for harvest mice sadly we didn't find any but as you can see they were still quite chuffed it was a a, a really good experience for them so do you want to help <laughs> if you're interested in helping looking for scottish harvest mice you can get in touch with me and i can train you and i can take you out in the field and um just show you how to find them then let you loose across scotland see what you can find 
it's uh, you know you can go to a site and it will maybe take you an hour or so to do this you can even just spend half an hour to do a small area it doesn't matter how big of area or how long you're doing it as long as you're going out and having a good look for harvest mice in the area and let me know exactly where you where you search because like i say every bit of data we get is really really important um so we can we can pinpoint where they are and if there are more colonies and even if you find nothing that really builds up the picture that we need to protect the ones even more over in North Asia, the ones which are there and are breeding and are succeeding. So it's really, really, really important to um, to get involved and get out there and um, uh, try and find these harvest mice. So just a few little photos to finish off with, not many. Um, this is a site in uh, Selkirk in the Scottish borders. Actually, it wasn't, it was north of Selkirk, sorry. Um, and on the left-hand side of that wall uh, was, um, in fact, I believe it was on the little mound, the little dried out grass mound on the top, where there were reports of a harvest mouse nest being found. So we travelled a long way to go down there. Um, took about two and a half hours to get there, and I had a really, really good bunch of volunteers. And you can see right at the front there is a, a familiar person that you won't recognise from that photo, but that's uh, Flo Blackbourne who was doing the gold talk the other night. Um, she also likes to get involved in, in wildlife surveys and uh, two of our friends there who also joined us on the search. So because the people weren't in when we got there, we could only search the boundary. So as you can see where the fence line is and the wall is, that is perfect habitat for harvest mice. If they're going to survive anywhere in that landscape, it's going to be in that really small strip of land. And that's literally how small of a territory they need or environment, because in that strip of land, the grass is left uh, alone. So it's not managed, it's not cut, it grows wild. And there's amazing grass tussocks there. I was absolutely amazed we didn't actually find a um, harvest mouse nest there. But if you look on the right-hand side of the photo, over the field, down by those trees, we actually found an unrecorded badger set, which um, was good. So I went down there looking, going into the reed beds because harvest mice will nest in reed beds. Um, and instead of finding the harvest mice in the reed bed, we actually found um, a, a badger set that hadn't been recorded before. So that was a, a big result. Now, harvest mice do nest in reed beds. So I'll give you a, a little bit of their um, background on their territory. So you'll typically find them in grass tussocks. They'll be about 10 to 30 centimetres off the ground. They like to be high up for their, their breeding nest. Keeps them away from ground predators because um, there's a lot of, pretty much every creature you can think of will eat a harvest mouse. But when you go to reed beds, nests can be anything from 60 centimetres to a metre off um, off the ground, up in the top of the reeds themselves. So it's always really good to go and have a look in those areas. And what we did here, even though at this site in the Scottish borders, we didn't find them in the immediate vicinity, we, we went all the way around the area. So we went fields over to the north, the west, the east and the south, and we check the whole area. So when I go to a place, I don't just check it, the point where they're found uh, or they've been claimed to have been found. I will check further afield in the hope that we can try and find um, harvest mice in the wider landscape because they might be in these places where people report them, but they also might be around the, the, the landscape as well. Uh, this is one of the harvest mice nests that we found last year. Um, this nest um, was in long grass right up against this stone wall. It was an absolutely beautiful little nest. It was about 30 centimetres off the ground. Um, and we actually found three in the small area where we found this one. And I actually have that one in my nature museum, which is over there. I would go and get it for you, but they're quite messy to handle because they fall apart quite easily. Um, but as you can see, they're absolutely fantastic little nest chambers. And this was a breeding nest. So this would have had the adults in there and um, all the young. And they have almost a hidden little entry points where they go in. You'd, you'd never find it by looking at it. And inside is a nice cozy little chamber where they can rear um, their little mice. And there is one there. I don't know if you can see it right in the middle of the picture. There's a harvest mouse nest in the long grass. That one I think was about 25 centimetres off the ground. I think that one, it doesn't look it, but... There's a lot of vegetation below that. But as you can see, the nest is right in the middle of the strands of grass coming up. And it's the leaves off these strands, which they'll use and entwine and, and turn into a beautiful little harvest mouse nest. Right. Well, that is um, the end of my talk. I could probably go on 
for ages about harvest mice nest. But if you have any questions, um, please do ask because I um, would love to to answer any questions anyone has regarding uh, harvest mice. Hi there, Kevin. Um, we have one question in the chat so far. So um, one of the attendees is asking, info please on how to find an ID workshop. I live four miles um, from Ken May Golf Course. Okay, so um, I think it's Lorna. I can see the chat. Lorna, thanks for your question. Um, and it's uh, so good you live so close to Kemney. I could have got you to done that for me, couldn't I? Instead of making that, that journey up there. But I did enjoy it. It's uh, There's lots of nature around Kemney Golf Course. Um, I guess, say, the best place to, to go if you want to learn about ID, go on the Mammal Society's website and look at the Harvest Mouse section. They have got amazing videos goes on a YouTube um, and guides to to run you through what to do there. They have a whole pack and it has photos of what you're looking for and where you're likely to find it and um, and, and and bits like that. So if you're interested, Lorna, um, please do get in touch. I can I can try and train you remotely if need be, or if I'm back up that way sometime soon, I'll, I would be delighted to show you what to do and go and find them. And if you think about this, Lorna, they were in Kemley Golf Course and around there. So there's every chance in the wider landscape around Kemney Golf Course, they could still be existing, but we just don't have the, the, the people power to go and look. And as the only coordinator in Scotland, I don't have unlimited days to go and search um, every every part of Scotland. I wish I could, that would be one heck of a journey. Brilliant, thank you. Um, there's two more questions. Um, so the first one is, have you, ever, have you ever known of harvest mice to live in buildings, especially in winter? Um, no, they, they typically, because they don't make nests like your house mice would do. They they build a nest out of grass, um, so they need that grass um, foundation to build a nest in and to weave their little beautiful nest that they make. So um, I don't know about England, but up here, and I've certainly never heard of them being in houses. Um, although I did have someone tell me they had harvest mice in their house once, and they did turn out just to be field mice, not harvest mice. Um, but no, I don't think there's any any records there. Like I say, they make the nest out of grass, so they need that grass tuft, that grass tussock to be able to build that that beautiful little nest design uh, in it. You know, so the next question is, is it abandoned nest which you take for the survey? Um, well, we don't always take them, to be honest. And I think that's Nicola. Thanks for your question, Nicola. Um, we don't always take them. I take a few for training purposes. So it's handy for me to identify old breeding nests and take them away uh, and, and show people what they're looking for. Now, it's OK to take the old grey nest away like you saw in the photos, because once they've used a, uh, a breeding nest and it's and they've raised that litter, they will go on to make a new one nearby. So they don't reuse the same nest again and again and again. It's only if you ever come across a nest which you think is a potential nest and it's still got green leaves on it, it means it's fresh and it's occupied. So um, just step back and, and, and leave it alone. I wouldn't even try and get a photo of that. I would just, just leave it well alone. But it is okay to take abandoned ones. Um, but like I said, they're, they're just those dried grass nests. They only use them the once. And then, yeah, so if you come across one and you like a nice silver near, like I said, I've got one in my um, my nature museum um, uh, just over there. Um, and I've got a couple which I use for demonstration purposes. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I have a question, actually. Um, is there any circumstances where if you found a field mice, you would recommend moving them? So, um, you know, have you ever come across one like on a road or on a pavement that you think um, if, if, if it was a, you know, a, a nest in use, would you recommend moving them in certain circumstances? Um, I would probably say no, because they're, they're so that they're, they're, they will it, basically if you stumble across a nest and you want to move because you don't think it's in the right place already, I wouldn't overrule the mouse. The mouse knows exactly what it's doing. They they they've been surviving in our landscapes for, for hundreds of years. So if you don't think they should be there, you can get in touch with the Mammal Society and let them know the details, but I wouldn't move them, especially if they got young in there, because there's a very good chance they're going to abandon them. And those young, even with the, the best wildlife rehabbers in the country, I think would really struggle to raise them. Um, so it's it's best if you're not sure about the situation that you find, then I would definitely say just to get in touch with myself or the Mammal Society and 
explain the situation, but I would I would never say to move them. They they live in such small areas. You, you're talking like 15 feet diameter, and that can be a whole territory. So they're very small. So if you moved them from somewhere else, you could well be putting them into somewhere where they might not have enough um, habitat. Oh, I just saw Anne, Anne said, could I stand to see the T-shirt? Yeah, this is a, a, a lovely gift from the One Kind team. It was a Stop the Coal um, hair care. So I wore it tonight because um, obviously just to, to promote uh, that I know the amazing work that one kind did getting that protection for our hairs um, is, is incredible. Thank you, Kevin. Um, so there's another re question. Um, the attendee mentioned there's some problems with sound, um, but is the reason for the low number um, in Scotland just that it, they've not been recorded as well as in England? Why are more recorded in England? Oh, that's a good one. Um, well, we don't know. There, there's people been have been out looking for harvest mice since we found that first nest, and we're still having sporadic reports um, of potential harvest mice. But we we don't know really, to be honest. We're we're not even at the very furthest part of their range. If you go around the globe, um, geographically, they you know they'll, they'll they'll go up into the Scandinavia. So we're not even the highest part on the, on the planet they will get. So they should be here. So it's it's a really hard one to answer. And in England, as you saw from the maps, there are hot spots where they're absolutely everywhere, which is really, really, really good. Um, and we don't know what's happened to the Scottish mice. And like I say, my theory, uh, Jeanette, is that the harvest mice in Scotland were the original Scottish harvest mice, which have been pushed out from human activity on the landscape. And it's it's forced them into areas where they can't survive and they've obviously died out. But with the ones that hunted them, they've obviously just got really, really lucky and um, and clung on there. But if we can get more surveyors, then we can we can survey more areas and try and find more and more and more harvest mice um, and seeing if they're in the landscape still. There is so much good habitat out there. Um, Scotland is a, a, an amazing wild country and it, it is perfect for harvest mice. They just don't seem to be in these places. If there were reintroductions done, you just you would have just too many good sites to even know where to start uh, to introduce them. So, and they are a real big, I mean, especially down in England, they're a huge important part of the ecosystem down there. Birds of prey uh, feed on them a lot. They are a main food source for a lot of species, but also in their own right, they they really help benefit the landscape. Um, and in England, I guess in England, it, you could say about the recording. They have a lot of surveyors down there. Like I say, surveyors down in England, sometimes they split counties up amongst surveyors because there's more people wanting to survey. Up in Scotland, there isn't. And then up here, I get a whole country to go and survey. And I can only I can only search certain amounts of Scotland in, in, a, in a three month period whilst trying to do everyday living life things as well. So it's a, it's a tough, tough one. But if anyone wants to get involved, please do get in touch. And we are looking at doing training sessions. In fact, um edf energy have got um some of their own staff who want to get involved and i'm hopefully training them up in, in the coming uh new year in january and getting them out there as well looking so um yeah thank you everyone if anyone's got any more questions please do ask away i'm more than happy to answer any question even if you think it seems silly just ask away there's no such thing as a silly question I've got a question, and it's maybe a really simple one. <laughs> okay, go for it. But I just, I just love your passion and enthusiasm when you're talking about a, a particular type of mouse, which I'd never heard of before. So I'm just curious, maybe this is a bit more of a general question, but I'm just curious what drove your passion for, I don't want to say obscure wildlife, but you, you, you have a broad range of knowledge across lots of different species and I'm really, really passionate about it. And I wonder where that started. Um, I don't know really. I was I was so very different to all my my friends growing up as a teenager. They were off going to parties and I was I literally was off watching wild rats in an alleyway as a teenager, because that to me was great fun. There was something that sparked there as a teenager, just going out looking for wildlife and um that's just I've, I've always kept that in my life for every, everything I've done everywhere I've gone and like say my business is about helping wildlife and I know how important doing surveys are so if I can spend my spare time doing more wildlife things which I love which is going to help species which is what I want to do why wouldn't I do it and um 
Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I've always had such a passion for the natural world. And like I say, I keep referring to my, my natural history museum. I literally have my own wildlife museum with artifacts from all over the all over the country in the world of all these things I've collected over the years, um, which Flo put together for me, which I was really, really lucky. But I, I don't know, it's that I'm passionate about everything from, and people will probably be like, oh, yeah, right. But even like a flea, or a wasp, or an ant, or a, a house mouse, a harvest mouse, it doesn't matter the species. If, if you spend the time, if, if you're really, really, really interested in wildlife, and you spend the time getting to know these species on their level, understanding how they think and behave, you, you cannot help but to, to be enthusiastic about them, I think. Amazing. And that leads on to another question from me. <laughs> okay, go for it. <laughs> so I love what you do with Humane Wildlife Solutions. I think it's fantastic because I think a combination of one for somebody like me, I'm vegan, I wouldn't be very happy about somebody coming and killing wasps or whatever in my house. But at the same time, I can't live with a wasp's nest, you know, like there's that personal conflict. But also, um, just that you've gone out and done something that's so different and really successful with it. But I'm really interested to hear from you because I know that the one of the differences that you do compared to sort of maybe classic pest control is that you try and educate people into not having those repeat problems again. Do you find that the either the commercial or the domestic properties that you do go out to that maybe haven't used you before have a higher respect and understanding for those species that are that they have the conflict with and are really open and receptive um, okay so that's a really good question so i would say for the vegan businesses and the vegan individuals that i go to their homes they already have that respect and love um for wildlife they don't want the harm coming to them and they really care and they're really invested about you know yeah we've got mice or rats in the house but we don't want them harmed um so they've already got that respect but you know, about 60% of my clients are not vegan. Even some of the, the really big high street stores that I do, and I do some really, really big high street names these days, are not solely vegan or even vegan businesses. Yet, they don't really care about the animal as much, but they care because the way I do it actually works. And I've proven, you know, we've been going over 10 years with Humane Wildlife Solutions, you know, and... I've done over 6,300 cases. I've saved anything between the tens to the hundreds of thousands of wild lives, you know, everything from ants, wasps, you name it. We've, we've done we've done a consultation or we've been out and helped them all over the world. And I mean, every continent we've, we've done a consultation on at least. Um, but it's just once I show the people that doing non-lethal ways, the way we do things actually works because it solves the problem. So, for example, if uh, if someone has a rat problem or a mouse problem, they put poison down. Yes, it may kill the the species in some part of the country. Um, the rodenticides, uh, the resistance in the rodent population is so high it barely affects them anyway. So, when you get to that stage, you're effectively just feeding them. And what people don't realise when you put bait boxes down, they're made to be attractive. So they actually attract rodents into an area, so you can actually see more coming in than you needed. And then if these rodents then ain't dying because of the poison and killing them. You're not solving your problem. You're basically just feeding them. But when we go out and we investigate the problem, and I always say I'm like a, I'm like a really rubbish Ace Ventura or a CSI investigation of a property. I go there and I look at every little bit of going, what's going on in that house regarding the mouse or the rat. I want to know where they've been, who they're hanging out with, where they're going to, what paths they're taking, what areas of the house they're active in, what's their food source, what's their motivation, because. To me, it's like a psychological battle with those those species. Once I understand all their motivations um, in that scenario, I can then start removing those motivations and stopping it back in again. And once we go and do our work, and then we finally, after all our work, put in preventative measures, they don't get back into the, the spaces I'm trying to protect, it's job done. And the best thing is, if it's like mice in your, in your house and we block them from getting into uh, the living spaces yes they might be in the walls and under the floors but if they don't get food they'll simply go back out to where they need to be and there's there's nothing better than the species you're working with um will, will know the best place for it to take itself so you can live trap um animals and and remove them but i always think it's better allowing them to make those choices themselves because they know exactly what they need and where to find those needs as well Oh, thanks, Kevin. 
Um, there's another question popped in the chat, um, bringing it back to harvest mice. Um, what is the average litter size? The average is around about five to six um, young they'll have. And they've got a really, really high mortality. So um, you'll have the, these little mice um, in the nest and they, they grow up really quick and they breed after a few weeks and it'll spread out and the nest will spread out. And uh, yeah, they, they, they have so many so quick because they are predated by pretty much everything. I don't think there's much out there which couldn't eat them. I wouldn't be even surprised if a slug could eat them. They don't. I'm just being silly. Uh, <laughs> um, but it's just I'm just trying to get a point across that pretty much everything will, will predate um, a harvest mouse. They have a really, really tough life. So if you imagine the natural um, pressures they have from being predated to humans controlling and destroying the landscapes that they need to survive in, they've got it tough. And it's no wonder they've been... They, they were thought to be gone from Scotland for so long and, until those ones at Hunterston were found again. Another question as well to follow up. Um, why do you think there were no harvest mice in Scotland? Why? Well, we knew they were there, <laughs> but we, we don't really know. That, that's the really big question. I, I don't know how we're ever going to find that an answer. I, I guess if we manage to survey every bit of Scotland and figure out if there are any other colonies left, we can drop a picture. But like, if we look at um, the Renfrewshire ones, so we know they're in Renfrewshire, round about south of Paisley down to Linwood. We know there were harvest mice there. So the only deduction we can make from that is those harvest mice must have been all over that area at one point. And then the way the land's been managed has forced them out. And you can almost say they've gone from up in Paisley being forced all the way, all the way down to the coast and they clung onto the coast because they found the one spot that humans don't disturb. So I can only assume um, that's that's where they're, that's the reason why they're there. Um, and to be honest, I still think that there they, they should be harvest mice around the Edinburgh bypass. I still think there could be some hanging on there somewhere but it's been very, very, very hard uh, to find them. But I will try, try and find them because it will be amazing to, to have the second breeding colony recognised in Scotland just outside the capital. Mm. Thanks, Kevin. Um, a few more questions have just popped in. Um, so, yeah, the webinar um, will be available again later um, for people um, who have loved your talk so much they want to see it again already. Oh. Um, so, yeah, we will get those available in the new year. Um, yeah, it's been recorded just now, so that's brilliant. Um, and the other question is, um, are mice, so not just harvest mice, um, territorial? In the past, I have caught mice in the house and released them in the wild, but then I uh, was worried about how they survive. Um, all possible entrances are now blocked so they can't get back in. Okay, first, Pam, well done on blocking those entrances up. It can be simple as that to solve a mouse problem sometimes. And by blocking the entrances, you clean not harmed them, so go you. That's, that's fantastic. Um, yeah, mice are... Mice are territorial, um, and it's all down to the food source. So the, the the amount of mice you get in a colony is always determined, and the number of mice you get is always determined by the amount of food they can get. So if mice get loads of food, they'll breed and you have lots and lots of mice. Now, let's say that you suddenly remove that food source. The only mice that are going to stay there, because the, the, let's say the food source drops by like 90% for that, all those mice that were there before. Now, all those mice, there's not enough food and there's too much stress on that colony. Now, the dominant male and female of that colony will fight and force the others out. So their young will be made to disperse. So the mice will disperse throughout a building until they find a new food source. So, yes, they can be very territorial and it's all down to food. If 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 there's lots of food, you'll get lots of mice. If there's not lots of food, you'll get the dominant mice holding that territory and that will be like that. Even in your gardens, there's you know, a lot of people might not even know there's mice in their gardens, but you will find um, uh, mice in, in pretty much most gardens because there's usually just enough for them to survive. Brilliant. And lastly, um, do you have any tips for people? As you say, like, I mean, I hope there's mice in my garden. Any wildlife would be great. So <laughs> do you have any tips for people to um, maybe help wildlife, but not make them, you know, too dependent on things or, you know, such as that? Um, I, I mean, it's always good to feed feed wildlife. I mean, a lot of people may not like to do it or they're worried if you feed wildlife, you attract rats and that. Um, but... Betty, if you want to help wildlife and feed them in your garden, the first thing I would say to do, and this is me putting on my, H, uh, my HWS hat here, 
is to make sure your home is secure first. So if you want to feed birds in the garden because it's a bad winter, just make sure your home's secure. So you're looking to make sure there's no possible entry points from the garden where you feed the animals to your home. Because that way then, even if you do get a couple of rats turning up in your garden, you don't need to worry because they can't get in your home. And they do live out there. You know, rats have every right to share our spaces with us, um, our gardens, our, our countryside, our parks. They're part of nature these days. They, they deserve to be there and they should be there. So if you if you do have them turn up, you don't need to worry. You can drop me a message if you want and I'll guide you through anything you need to do. But if you want to help wildlife, just make sure your home's secure and then you've got more freedom to do so because you know that wildlife isn't suddenly going to move in with you unless you want them to move in with you. I'll probably not recommend it. They're better outside um, where where they, they thrive really well. But I would say also doing surveys like I've done. You know, I've done surveys for wetland bird surveys, breed and bird surveys, um, national butterfly surveys, water vole surveys. Oh, you know, I could go on all night. All these surveys were done is just finished our badger survey. Um, so yeah, there's so much you can do. And the best thing about doing these surveys is you'll get the full training on how to do them and you'll get out in the countryside and you'll see some amazing things like discovering badger sets, which weren't thought to be there or finding a, a lost species in, in Scotland, which wasn't meant to be in the country at all. You know, they're, they're the kind of things you can find. And it's, I guess you can say it's it's kind of like a really bad Indiana Jones. Um, you're not looking for the lost treasures. You're looking for the lost species. And let's face it, there's plenty of those in, in Scotland. Brilliant. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I think if no one has any last questions, that's all the questions being asked. Um, I'll just remind everyone, we have popped a link into Kevin's business, Human Wildlife Solutions, um, at the top of the chat. Um, please do, if you have a moment this evening, to check it out. Obviously, it's the UK's uh, non-lethal vegan alternative to pest control. Um, I mean, Kevin really is a superhero for wildlife across the UK, so please do see all the incredible work that he's done um, and will continue to do as well. Um, yeah, do, anything you'd like to add, Kevin? Um, I just want to say thank you to the One Kind team. I love the winter warmers and I love being apart from this is... I think maybe the second or third one I've done for, for, for you now. And I'm just in awe of the work you do. You are really leading the way, I think, in Scotland, um, making this country better for, for wildlife. And everyone in the team there, from Bob all the way to yourselves and everyone else that plays their part, we would our, our wildlife and our animals in Scotland would be so worse off if, if one kind wasn't there. So thank you for allowing me to to ramble on and bore people to death about harvest mice. Um, um, but also thank you for all the incredible work that One Kind does. And um, yeah, if anyone in the chat hasn't done, go go give One Kind a follow and a like and and your support because it's really important that we we keep One Kind uh, supported through for their campaigns because just like the hairs on the t-shirt, um, they made like One Kind played huge roles um, there. And also, um, even with the new hunting laws coming in, one kind played a massive part. And I luckily through Humane Wildlife Solutions also were with one kind making uh, making those changes too. So um, we've been, Humane Wildlife Solutions, one kind of been a good partnership for, for many years and for many years to come, I'm sure we'll, we'll both be uh, standing up for Scottish animals. We'll book you in again for next year, right? Yeah, you got me down. That's fine. Yeah, I'm like I'm more, more than delighted to do that. It's, it's only depends if your audience want to put up with me for another hour. Or so. <laughs> <laughs> no, getting so many compliments in the chat, and um, just saying how you know inspiring and fantastic your your chat was, Kevin. Um, and thank you for the kind words, but weren't kind. Um, we didn't even ask you to say that, so that's yeah, not that's yes. great. Then. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but that, that's us um, come towards the end of our webinar. Um, a little bit sad, actually. It's the last one in the series um, and the last one of the year because also we're approaching um, the end of the year. Um, so, yeah, it's, you know, that's our time. Again, thank you so much for um, everyone's time this evening. Thank you so much um, a million times over to Kevin for the fascinating chat and putting together such a great presentation. Um, I'm sure everyone's learned so much about Harvest Mice. Um, and I guess, finally, um, I hope everyone has a safe and happy festive period um, and wish everyone the best for the new year. So we look forward to seeing you then. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Bye, everyone. Take Bye, care. Everyone.